Willem van Wennekom studied classical languages and law. Before being appointed judge at the court of Amsterdam, he worked for several years as a lawyer for asylum seekers. During the 70s and 80s, he became known as a, what was then called, political lawyer, successfully preventing the extradition of Vietnam deserter Ralph Waver in 1972. He also defended Rote Armee Fraktion members Schneider and Wackernagel, as well as a member of the Irish Republican Army. In 2006, he retired as vice president of the court in Amsterdam, and in his essay on floating ice about the functioning of the judicial state, he claims that in the Netherlands, the trios politica, the classical separations of the powers, has ceased to exist, being replaced by what he calls a universe without structure. Mr. van Bennekom, could you perhaps comment on what we have heard from Professor Sisson from your perspective, both as judge and as lawyer, and perhaps in particular, departing from your thesis on the disappearance of the separation of powers and the increasingly strong grip or influence of politics on the juridical branch. Let me begin then with a small piece of history. Somewhat more than 140 years ago, Karl Marx, who was then already notorious in most of the Western world as the author of Das Kapital, delivered what was to be his last public speech. Mr. Marx said, 140 years ago, I would not deny that there are countries such as America, England, and if I were more familiar with your institution, I would perhaps also add Holland, where the workers can attain their goals by peaceful means. So, the top protagonist of the inevitable, inevitable class struggle professed himself 140 years ago an advocate of the nuance. To say it in legal terms, he underlined the importance to relate always to the specific circumstances of the case before advocating this or that revolutionary means. Now, what is perhaps the most interesting part about this whole uh, anecdote is something else. Because Mr. Marx was not included in any kind of list after his speech or even before that list. No blessed blacklisting in that time. So, so much about progress of legality, progress of civilization. But there is also Dear listeners, another reason why I started with this old story. To my way of thinking, it makes clear to us that speaking about revolution and the law, because in the core that's what we talk about this afternoon perhaps, our first duty is to be accurate. And it is my belief that history can help us, does help us sometimes, as a matter of fact, to avoid sloppiness. Before knowing this anecdote, I did myself, for instance, not know that Karl Marx was so particular about the necessity of the world revolution. And there is something else as well. It is my firm belief that in the field of argument, slogans do not bring us anywhere, but that on the contrary, they can sometimes be quite dangerous, especially what I call out there, outside this fantastic ambiance in the real world. Big words may sometimes be appropriate to denounce specific forms of injustice, but they are relatively rarely adequate to settle a dispute or to bring solutions, no matter who is who in the dispute and what the dispute is about. Now I come to the core of what I have to say. That has, being myself a lawyer, 
has to do with law. And it has to also to begin with a distinction, making a distinction between the law as it exists, as interpreted by the courts, and what the law could be or what the law should be. So the classic distinction between jus constitutum on the one hand and jus constituendum on the other hand. Now, my first remark in this respect is that the law, as it stands, is not in a position to bring justice in cases with a predominant political or revolutionary goal or context. Just as politics and just as the revolution go by their own logic, or logics, I should say, the law goes by the legal logic. And I agree readily with Mr. Stahl, who in his introductory remark said, it is perhaps even our duty, if I understood you correctly, to explore the outer bounds of what is possible in the field of law. That is something I absolutely agree on. But at the same time, um, the twin the revolution and the law, it is hard to see where they could meet. Most of us will still remember the famous last words of, for instance, Fidel Castro, who in his uh, trial, the trial against him in 53 in Cuba, um, being himself a lawyer, he knew exactly what to say, and he ended his concluding speech for the defense as la historia mi absolvera, famous words. But just as the revolutionary will say la historia mi absolvera, the court always will have to say, well, okay, that's all very well, but now we have to talk business. Consequently, they, and I mean the law and the revolution, they belong to different worlds. They simply don't fit and they don't meet. The acceptations, no, the ex expectations we have of law and justice are, in my belief, overstretched if we assume they do. They do fit and they do meet. The maximum we can expect to do a court is being fair, to have a fair hearing, to have a fair trial, and to have a fair judgment. And that is why it is so extremely helpful that Mr. Ferman pointed out in his contribution that in this respect, especially in this respect, um, the courts fail. That is uh, something which we cannot stress too much, also in my opinion. It is precisely because of this that legal rulings in cases of this kind are so often disappointing. No matter we speak of PKK, uh, by the way, some alleged PKK members find themselves in prison uh, at this very moment in Holland without knowing exactly, as far as I know, what, uh, the, um, what is exactly the, uh, the case brought against them. Uh, PKK, CPP, FARC, Hamas, you can make quite a long list of organizations uh, which label themselves as liberation movements. But just as the defendant in cases of this kind can rarely claim a political victory in court, the judge will be hopefully affair, aware of the fact that he is not addressing the core of the problem. And even more so that he cannot solve the problem. The maximum he can do, and I stress this again, is to come to a fair judgment. And that is why it is so uh, depressing and so, so fundamentally wrong what's going on in cases of this type um, we discussed this afternoon. Now, a second remark, and perhaps a last remark, because uh, I am also bound to time limits. As I have try to point out in, for instance, this essay op drijfijs, floating ice, 
the, so to say, classic rule of law is, in my opinion, receding, not only in Holland, but in most of Western Europe, or perhaps most of Europe. Most of you will perhaps know, have heard about the existence of an agency called Frontex, which is a European agency uh, especially designed and especially instituted to prevent possible refugees entering Europe. And it is Frontex who is responsible and who has the severe responsibility for pushback operations, for operations which are not only uh, uh, operated in a legal vacuum, but who have the effect that possible refugees are sent back to countries where they could be, and in many ex any examples, have been persecuted and prosecuted. Well, it is only one example, but um, it is the European Union, which its high, uh, which is banner in which big words are written, democracy, justice, uh, equality for all, uh, big words, but as a matter of fact, be it in the matter of proceedings in cases of this type, or being uh, whether we talk about the protection of refugees or possible refugees, the reality in uh, the European Union is quite different. Um, some of you will have read perhaps in the Dutch newspaper Trouw last Thursday a very helpful article by Sophie in het Veld, who is a European parliamentarian for political party D66, D66, who points out uh, in a really shocking way um, in how many ways even a, a Euro parliamentarian uh, meets the taboo uh, secret, 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 and she simply does not, is not able to proceed further. So uh, I think I made uh, myself clear on this point. Um, there are many examples, apart from the, uh, the procedures of Mr. Sison, uh, in which secrecy and taboo and anxiety and what, 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 what have you have replaced the fundamental requirements for a fair trial. And that is uh, something we should do something about. It is my belief that if we would be successful in a big, difficult operation of this kind, because everybody who challenges the system, like the lawyers do, and like the individuals do, uh, is facing states, and is facing state policies, and behind those states, there is sometimes even an invisible hand, which makes it even more um, uh, puzzling, but also more frustrating. It is my belief that if this fight would be successful, um, that the judicial power um, will be regained, the power of control by the courts. Um, it is it has to be done not for the sake of the revolution, that's a different field, it has to be done for the sake of the rule of law. And that is my final conclusion. Thank you very much.